Hello everybody, you're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry, and we catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the York Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for the Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us, and we are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. You can also reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. We're going to head over to the Rye Light Zone for the latest installment in, for the for the latest installment of Insomniac, which is a novella by myself, Dane Cobain. Week 35, day two. Living with her mother required some adjustment. For a start, the old woman had started to treat her like a child again. She gave Kate a bedtime and made sure she stuck to it, whether she managed to sleep or not. Most of the time, she didn't. She just stayed up all night and stared at the wall, waiting for the dawn to come. For the first couple of nights, she'd given up and climbed back out of bed, then headed downstairs into the living room. But her mother was having none of that. It was as though she had some sort of sixth sense. She had an uncanny knack of heading downstairs at just the right time to catch her daughter in the act. If she found her there in the living room after the all-powerful lights out, then she'd send her back up to her room with a clip round the ear. Kate hadn't slept since she'd left the old house, but it wasn't from lack of trying. Her body just refused to shut down, and her brain kept reminding her that her old routine was dead and that she'd need to adopt a new one. She'd been up for the best part of four days without any stimulants, and the world was starting to look sluggish and artificial. At night, when she was confined to her bedroom, she listened to the wind and rain outside and the sounds that the cars made as they meandered past. From time to time, she'd overhear a snatch of conversation as two youths walked past with their hoods pulled up to ward off the cold. Other than that, she was alone in her room. Mostly alone. Zeb never really left her. His eyes watched over her around the clock, and he'd started to follow her not just at night when she was confined to the bedroom, but during the day as well. He even followed her onto the bus to the dole office, swiping the seat next to her. The other passengers seemed to somehow know that something was there and so they never took the vacant seat. Either that or nobody wanted to sit next to the gaunt young woman who looked like a junkie and who muttered to herself as the bus cursed through the streets. Like a boxer slumped against the corner of the ring, Kate was struggling to stay above water. She wasn't sure how long she could keep on fighting. Week 36, day 3. Kate had landed herself a job. True, it wasn't anything special. She was working part-time hours for minimum wage at a charity shop and using her earnings to pay off the debt to her old landlord, but it was something and, as her mother liked to say, it kept her out of trouble. The old women that she worked with thought she was some sort of goddess. She had a knack for valuing items and listing the best of the bunch on eBay, and if they left her alone in the stockroom, she could sort stuff like there was no tomorrow. That was because she had a helping hand. Zeb wasn't exactly docile, but it turned out that the apparition had a soft spot for sorting through things. He told her that he fed off the psychic vibrations that the objects had attached to them. Like her adjustment to the lack of sleep, she marvelled at how quickly she'd grown to tolerate the ghost that plagued her. Since Nana Knight and her second demise, Kate had lost the will to fight. She'd seen what happened. And so Zeb had gone from being a malign influence, a tumour on the biological matter of life, to being a guardian angel, albeit a fallen one. Kate was working in the stockroom when her neck gave out. She felt fine, and then all of a sudden she didn't. It tensed right up, and she dropped the box she was carrying with the clatter of broken crockery and the rattle of spilled knickknacks. She threw a hand automatically to her neck and tried to massage some life into it. What's going on in there? Kate flinched. The voice belonged to Maud, the shop's assistant manager. If she found out that Kate had damaged the goods, she might go full Mr Murray on her and tell her to go home and not come back. But she was also a kindly old lady, and Kate trusted her gut for once and made a decision. My neck, she shouted. Something's wrong with it. I can't move it. Maud came bustling through into the back room and rushed over to her. What happened? I don't know, Kate said. She tried to move it again, but it was still locked tight and inflexible. Maud, I'm scared. I need you to do me a favour. What is it? I need you to call me an ambulance. Week 37, day one. The good news was that there was nothing seriously wrong with her neck. She'd been having visions about being confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life or of being diagnosed with some sort of degenerative muscle disease. It turned out that she had a bad case of cramp, which the doctors assumed was a side effect of her severe lack of sleep. They gave her a neck brace and discharged her, but her neck continued to get worse over the coming days until she was forced to call in sick. The bad news was that she still had no diagnosis. She had hope, though. She'd been booked in for another session with Dr Jalopnik at the Sleep Research Centre and the day finally arrived on the Monday of week 37. You've lost some weight, Dr Jalopnik observed. Too much weight. We're going to have to run some more tests. 
tests, Kate murmured. Again, what are we hoping for this time? A diagnosis, the doctor replied. I have a few ideas. She paused for a moment. You know, this weight loss isn't good for you. We need to figure out what's causing it. It can't go on. Tell me about it, Kate said. I'm wasting away here. Are you eating? Yes, she replied. Why does everyone keep asking that? Hmm, Dr. Jalopnik said. I wonder. Kate waited for the punchline, but it didn't come. What? she asked. I'm going to see if I can get you a session in the tank, Dr. Jalopnik replied. Week 38, day 3. Kate had lost half a stone in the week or so since her last appointment with Dr. Jalopnik, and she was starting to worry that if they didn't find a cure for her soon, she'd literally waste away until her pale skin turned translucent and her bones stuck out from her body. She'd seen photos of people with eating disorders and the thought of it filled her with horror. She didn't want to end up like that, and the prospect was made worse by the fact that nothing seemed to help. She was eating as much as she could, scoffing down huge portions of her mother's greasy food and deliberately eating stuff that was full of fat and calories, but none of it helped. It's not as though I can't keep it down, she thought. It's like the calories don't even count, like the food's passing straight through me without touching the sides. Either the food is a ghost or I am. That was the latest instalment of Insomniac by myself, Dan Cobain. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Bitterroot with their version of All Along the Watchtower.
You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with this week's guest, who is author, Wolfie Smoke. The first question is one I'm sure you'll have a, a good answer to. Uh, it's, it's one I ask everybody. It's, uh, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? The last book I read? Uh, yeah. it, was a, it was a book called uh, Beauty. I forget the author's name, but it was a retelling of Beauty and the Beast. Mm-hmm. Uh uh, closer to the uh the the original fairy tale i really enjoyed it i've been on a beauty and the beast kick recently so it was it was very fun and uh i enjoyed it it spent a lot of time talking about uh the setup with her and her merchant father uh and them losing their thing which i enjoyed and the writing was very beautiful as well i want to see uh yes uh robin mckinley yes okay cool yeah, it was a very it was a very wonderful beauty and the beast retelling and then presently i'm reading uh, uh the westing game which i'm only a couple chapters into right now but it's very good cool well and obviously we're going to talk quite a little uh, quite a bit about books as well i think we'll start with talking about books i want to want to chat a bit about youtube as well um yeah. but one of the first things i wanted to ask obviously for yourself both as a reader and, and as a writer i suppose you have a kind of a particular interest in middle grade and i wondered if you could define for us what is middle grade and what makes for a good middle grade book Ooh, that's a good question uh well I, to me it's uh books that are targeted between like the 12 to 14 maybe uh you could expand it to like 10 to 14 that's what I usually of uh, the as age range. Mm-hmm. That's what I would usually think of it is as. Um, it's hard to define what makes a good one. I guess it's I, there's got to be a really nice balance of uh, a co- complex enough to be a good story, but not too complex that it's outside of what the audience can comprehend. Because. Mm-hmm. Me personally, I enjoy more complex stories as opposed to simpler ones. Uh, and so I really enjoy uh, things like Harry Potter and things that are a bit more involved and have characters with deeper backstories. And I, and I think uh, age appropriateness is very important too, which is kind of hard as well because you have you have like you want to talk about difficult topics because they're Mm -hmm. real life and books help kids with real life situations but also at the same time you don't want to throw them into the world of adulthood too quickly now that makes sense and i mean i think um i guess like one of the things that I find kids tend to, I say kids, um, but you know, uh, that, that kind of age range, they, you know, they tend to be quite good at telling when someone's like writing down to them or dumbing things down for them. And I think Harry Potter yeah. as well is a great example of, uh, for me at least, I think good, good middle grade books. You can kind of revisit them as an adult and you'll see layers there that you maybe didn't pick up on when you were a kid. Um, you know, it's the kind of stuff that, that, you know, uh, uh, you know, a 10 to 14 year old could read the book and their parent could read the book and they both enjoy yeah. it because there's 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 things there for, for both of them, I suppose. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. Uh, it, I think that's a, a perfect way to say it. I think I forget the exact quote, but I think C.S. Lewis, I think it's C.S. Lewis said something like the best children's stories are the ones that you can still enjoy, enjoy as an adult. Mm. And I think that's a really good thing. And I think what you said about you, you, people can really tell when you're dumbing things down too much for them when you're talking yeah. down to them and it comes off a little bit you know it's not it's not a nice feeling to have yeah yeah for sure and why do you think it's so important for people i suppose particularly of that middle grade age um to have good books you know why why does it matter that we have good middle grade i think It matters a lot because stories are very powerful and they really structure the way you think, you know, I don't know about you, but the way I, I think is a lot based on the stories I consumed Mm -hmm. as a child have really 
foundationalized what I think of that in the the Bible. And I think that's a really good, I think they're really important because when children read stories and they can see either hope or hopelessness in them and another C.S. Lewis quote, uh, they need, they already know that dragons exist, but they need to know that dragons can be slayed. And it's very important and stories can be very powerful and very meaningful and uh, help people through difficult times and help them to grow as people. Yeah, for sure. Well, and you mentioned, um, you mentioned the Bible there. You mentioned uh, C.S. Lewis as well, who obviously, um, you know, he was, he was a Christian as well. And I wondered like um, how, how does your faith play a part in like, I guess your life in general, but in particular, uh, your creativity and, uh, you know, the writing you do, the videos you make and things like that. Yeah, I think it plays a big part. Obviously, I love Jesus and I've accepted Jesus uh, as my Lord and Savior. And obviously, accepting him as Lord, uh, he's my Lord. So I uh, want everything I do to be honoring to him. Mm -hmm. So I like... In all of my creative things, I like to think there's a subtle. I, I think he's in my heart, and I have the Holy Spirit in my heart. I know that it comes out of uh, my creative works naturally, because obviously, you're you're when you're doing creative works, your worldview and what's in your heart mm. comes out very naturally. And so, I think that it comes out naturally a lot. But I also like to uh, make some intentional things too, like. In uh, my YouTube videos, I've started using Jesus Loves You as an outro because I want people yeah. to know that Jesus loves them. And then I thought, well, uh, most people don't watch to the end. So I also started saying praise Jesus at the beginning. And I, in, in my books, I try to make a role for myself. You know, uh, books have opening quotes that like they'll have a quote. And I like to pick a piece of scripture that will uh that goes along with the story not just the random scripture but one that really i think captures the heart of the story mm -hmm. like uh right now i'm trying to work on publishing my book noah denying the storm and it's very much about dealing with fear and so i picked especially fear of storms and so i picked uh mark 440 which is the story of Jesus calming the storm and I uh put and I put uh and I put the line where Jesus says why are you so afraid do you are you still so faithless yes yeah yeah no, that makes sense well um we you mentioned your YouTube channel there and I suppose that's you know that's where I first first came across you um how long have you been making YouTube videos and what kind of content do you create uh, I've been making videos uh, on uh, my channel that I'm is main right now. I I made it, I think I started that in December of 2016. 2016. I remember because I was supposed to be doing NaNoWriMo, but then halfway through NaNoWriMo, I decided I'm just going to film a book video instead. Yeah. And then before that, I still I've still really enjoyed. Uh, filming things i know me and my friends used to film things all the time and i know when i was a kid i would my parents always said i went around with the camera and photographed random things in the house but uh on main you on youtube i've mainly been doing it since 2016 and i've uh i've it's changed a little bit i start i started uh mainly focused on books but i also wanted to do some other things uh, to some degree, my channel is for other people, and to some degree, it's personal to me. Like, I like to capture, like, a scrapbook. I, I like yeah. to think of it as, like, a scrapbook that happens to be public, but I also like to see it grow as well and it be a platform. So I've made lots of book videos, and I stopped making book videos for a while, but then, then recently, I've started being more interested in making book videos, and I've also made uh, some games gaming videos like sims and minecraft and i've made 
I've made like some personal vloggy things. Like I recently did one of cleaning out my closet while talking about <laughs> why certain, how certain uh, clothes affect my insecurity and things. Yeah. Cool. Well, and I, I, I meant I wanted to ask you as well, specifically about your your uh, your Sims videos, because um, you're calling it a, like a rotational let's play as well, and you're following a whole bunch of different characters. And I think you can tell that you're a writer from your approach to playing The Sims because of how much you know your characters and their backstories and things like that. And I wondered, can you introduce us to a few of the uh, a few of the Sims that are in your let's play? Uh, yes, um, that's a, I think that's a very cool thing because I do think a lot of my writerness comes out in my Sims. Uh, yes, uh, the characters that I mainly think of is uh, uh, there's Gwen Winlust and then her two children, Antonio Vorhand and Prince Vorhand, and their uh, uh, their father has. Uh, abandoned them and so now Antonio uh, ha kind of has to keep up the household a and their mother Gwen is very spacey and like kind of deals with things by being uh, not quite in touch with reality so her teenage son has to <laughs> keep their household grounded and keep them from going under and so that's been a fun storyline and then their uh 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 what's the other one the uh the other one is uh another uh of my favorite households in that rotation is uh bonnie and jack which who are in a re in a relationship and in a growing relationship and their boyfriend and girlfriend but bonnie is uh, a cop and jack is a secretly a uh, criminal behind the scenes so <laughs> Uh, there should be some fun things happening when she finds out about that. <laughs> yep. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with author Wolfie Smoke, and this is Hoga's Wolf with Books and the Bicycle.
Left the cottage at the end of the road Not knowing how far we could go But a monument continues to grow And a ram of black beautiful foes Daisy dances on Luna Kings A bike called Drew is running his dreams And those books on those bicycles They're still a done in luck That was Hoga's Wolf with Books and the Bicycles. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for me to be rejoined in conversation now by this week's guest, who is Wolfie Smoke. And so I want to, uh, obviously, I want to touch a bit more on your writing as well. So um, I guess, like, you have your your alias or your pen name of, of Wolfie Smoke. And um, where does where does the name come from? And who is Wolfie? Yes, yeah, so, well... Uh, you want to have a name that's memorable and that sticks with people and also suits with your with your uh, audience which I think Wolfie Smoke does very well and Wolfie is kind of like a, a self-imposed nickname a little bit in my house because I just am really a big fan of wolves and, and the concept of werewolves and things so I enjoy so I, I kind of when I was a teenager I kind of stuck like when I uh write my name on things sometimes i'll write wolfie instead of daniel and you can see i have wolfie as my nickname on zoom instead of daniel as well Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's and i'm not sure where smoke came from i guess i just wanted something that felt mysterious and you you know smoke and mirrors and all that thing so i wanted something to capture a mysterious element for the sake of the writing and i just thought the name sounded cool yeah, and I thought Ooh. it suited well with my works as well. Yeah, and it, and I think you know, just as as a name by itself, I think it it kind of rolls off the tongue a bit as well. Um, but yeah, and you you mentioned like it goes well with your works. What can you tell us about your your writing? Um, you know, what's your style? What are some of the themes you cover? And um, you know, do do you have books out at the moment? I have one book out that I published back when I was 14. I self-published it called Sea of Trees. Uh, and I don't I don't want to uh, uh, rough on my own works, but you can kind of tell that I wrote it when I was 14. Mm-hmm. And now I'm trying to work on No Denying the Storm, which I have uh, a cover designer working on at the moment when I'm very excited about me the the first draft of the cover uh just before this started so i'm really excited about that so that should be out before the end of the year and i really enjoy themes of redemption like sea of trees is about these two boys that really hate each other 
but then they end up being friends by the end. And I like, mm-hmm. I enjoy redemptive arcs of like villains becoming good guys and time travel seems to be something I'd like to touch on a lot too, which is odd because it's not something I've ever touched on a lot, but no denying the storm touches on time travel and a lot of the uh, ide- uh, ideas I think will most likely be exploring in the future touch on time travel. And you mentioned, yeah. obviously, um, we talked about how as, as a kid, you always had your, you, you know, your video camera and you were taking photos, uh, you know, and you've got your writing, you've got your YouTube videos. I mean, do you have any other creative hobbies as well? Do you do any kind of art or music or anything like that? Uh, yes, I took art classes for several years and you might not be able to tell it from my art because I mainly just draw little cartoon characters most of the time but i have a sketchbook which isn't doesn't have that much but i like to doodle in that a lot and i i enjoy scrapbooking and making pages look nice on scrap in scrapbooks and documenting memories and i enjoy you know i'm one of those people that whenever i find some sort of something creative on the internet i like to dabble in it a little bit yeah most of them don't stick but scrapbooking and you know fancy journaling like you've seen those people that do like really fancy journaling and scrapbook pages and such is that and i've done a little bit of painting and a little and a a good bit of drawing as well yeah well i suppose even going back to the the, you know the games that you've played uh, uh or that you've I suppose you played the most on your YouTube with with Minecraft and The Sims, and both of those are very, you know, they're games in which you create things. You know, literally in in Minecraft, you're building houses, and, uh, you know, in The Sims, you're building the world, but you're also, again, building houses, um, building the characters out as well. So that's kind of interesting that you're attracted to those kinds of games rather than, I don't know, something more destructive, like, I don't know, you know, Fortnite, even or or, or whatever mm-hmm. so it's funny that even the your choice of games i think kind of is quite creative choices yes <laughs> i think you can really tell my personality based on the the things that i choose um i've only got a few more questions i want to cover one of them uh, going back to youtube who are some of your favorite youtube channels uh to watch when you're not creating my favorite youtube channels uh yeah i enjoy I really enjoy watching it as like just to me I love like there's lots of really good uh uh smart YouTube things so I don't want this to come off the wrong way but for me I really enjoy YouTube as just mindless entertainment like I enjoy like as opposed to like watching TV shows or something with a structured act. I enjoy just, you know, I enjoy just like the funny, the funny yeah. things, and like so. I've I've watched a lot of, uh, of a guy called Failboat recently, which he's very funny, and I've watched a lot of Lore Inside, not as much recently. Um, obviously, we've talked about your love of middle grade, um, but within middle grade and just across books as a whole, what are some of your favorite uh, genres to read in and what makes them your favorite? Well, I, uh, I enjoy fantasy mainly. I like, especially lower fantasy. That's like, it's mainly real life, but it has fantasy elements. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy, I also enjoy a good uh, realistic contemporary novel now and then i sometimes i just like to enjoy like seeing a character going through a hard time i think that's a fun thing to read about uh i also enjoy reading a good a bit of classics you know it's nice it's nice going into classics knowing that they're tested by time yeah. and they're a, a solid bet for a good read even if sometimes it'll go over my head a good lot of, of the time he, and yeah. and so those are some of my favorites and I, I meant to ask you this earlier actually <laughs> when you were talking about again um the importance of of good books for younger readers and you mentioned 
from your own childhood there's there's some books you remember reading and um the kind of a formative books for you what are some of those books that were super important to you uh when you were a younger reader well i know uh the the series that really got me interested into reading and writing was the magic treehouse series mm -hmm. that was the big one for me and uh i i enjoyed those and I also enjoyed the Narnia books. Those were big, big for me. It, there's so many books. I remember my mom would read us books a lot. She would read us uh, the. I remember she read us the series of unfortunate events. Yeah, which was really good. And she read. I don't think she did read us the Harry Potter's. I think I read Harry Potter later myself, and yes there's the mind goes blank when you ask about the books you know i literally i remember the red wall books i love the red wall books and uh the alice in wonderland is a big big one for me as well well and that goes back to what you were saying about classics as well where you you know that's classic middle grade i suppose See, there's also like the secret garden and pinocchio all those solid classic middle grades. Awesome. And finally, um, it's kind of two questions in one and we've touched on it a little bit, but um, what have you got planned next and where can people follow you to find out more and to stay in, uh, stay up to date with what you're up to? Uh, yes. Uh, presently, as I said, I'm trying to get uh, No Denying the Storm published. It's a, it's a middle grade book about time travel and fear, as we've discussed. Uh, uh, I've been posting about it a lot uh, on my Instagram mainly on at Wolfie Spoke on Instagram. I'm also on uh, YouTube as we've talked about as the Reading Werewolf, which as we've discussed is mostly Sims. I, I'm going to post some about my writing on there too now that I'm working on it, but mainly my writing I talk about on uh, uh, the Instagram as well, and then I also have a website which needs redoing but uh that is wolfysmoke.com big thanks to wolfie smoke for joining me you're listening to the arch on 106.6 fm wickham sound i'm your host dane cobain and this is luna barge with adventure two three four we're going on an adventure this land is ours to run So grab some snacks and jump in the car When the sun begins to yawn All we need is just you and me And a road pointing for the door This is our adventure Take chances while we can and I know no better plan This is our adventure Gonna write it on the page And I'll meet you on the stage We're climbing high on the hills Meeting monsters on the way So keep your eyes on the road This could be our lucky day Catching stars on our fingertips Where the darkness swallows our view We can fall from time to time But we'll know just what to do This is our adventure Take chances while we can And I know no better plan this is our adventure, gonna write it on the page, and I'll meet you on the stage. Scraping up our knees We've 
been chased by dinosaurs while the rainstorm pours. Picked each other up when we've fallen down and then we laugh until we cry. We keep going, we'll never give up, we're gonna soar into the sky. This is our adventure, let's run away together, let's make it last forever. This is our adventure, we're gonna see the sights, it's gonna last the rest of our lives. This is our adventure, take chances while we can, and I know no better plan. This is our adventure, gonna write it on the page, and I'll meet you on the stage. I'll meet you on the stage Ooh, yeah. I'll meet you on the stage Everyone's putting you down Pushing you around Trying to catch you out And now You'll never find me now I've gone up into the clouds Alone without a sound Cause when you come around then I'll be waiting on my cloud Beside me lies the one key of mine It's a painful story, the tragic truth The realisation of my identity Woke up on the wrong side of the bed Feeling like I'm dead With all the bad thoughts in my head but you'd, you better watch where you tread Cause you're the ones who fed The dangers I now dread Cause when you come around Then I'll be waiting on my cloud And beside me lies the one key of my youth It's a painful story, a tragic truth Realization of my identity Just think what it would be like to be me See all that I can see And be all I could ever be But you, you only care for the money Or the fame and the glory don't care what comes of me
That was Tragic Truth by Dan Pride, and before that we had Luna Barge with Adventure. But you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Elk Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Cocteau Twins. Treasure. I am not sure how I have in my possession a near-perfect copy of the Treasure LP by the Cocteau Twins. Since I now have a turntable and have found myself doing these recommendations, I have an excuse. Also because Liz Fraser, the singer on this album, co-wrote and sang on Teardrop by Massive Attack, and I have for a long while been meaning to check out her earlier work. It may be because I had a friend who worked for their record company. That was how I got to see them play at Sadler's Wells Theatre, about the time this album came out, sort of 1984-ish. I had heard them on the radio, but seeing three people on a tape recorder recreating the sound I had heard on the radio was not that entertaining. But I was on the guest list. I went with a beautiful woman and it was a good excuse to dress in black and wear eyeliner. I was nearing the end of my rock and roll years and my desire to experience the new was waning fast. I was not aware that I was watching something that would spawn subgenres and influence generations of musicians. To me the remarkable thing was that I was at a rock gig at Sadler's Wells and it was the most arty and pretentious show I had attended. The album is a beautiful artefact. The graphics on the cover and the label, the artful band logo, the feel of the cardboard, the massive sound that washes over the big drums and clear bass, the tinkling chimey noises that steer it away from an all-out goth fest. But most of all, it is Liz Fraser's crystal clear soprano that cuts through the bombast with sparkling melodies that any songwriter would cover. Sometimes pure spectre pop and sometimes haunting, like Kathy at the window or the call of the sirens, sometimes almost ecclesiastically soaring on the wings of a dove. There may as well be no lyrics because the voice is like the lead instrument in instrumental pieces. They seem to be able to make great washes of sound come at you like waves rolling and breaking on the beach. Treasure the Cocteau Twins. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave a short review on your podcast platform of choice. You can also reach out to me here at the studio if you're so inclined. My email address is dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune. This is the incredible Alice Jane with Wait. I'll catch you next week.